We all need a break from the constant cycle to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying The Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. Nobody knows for sure how many buckets of urine Hennig Brandt kept in his basement. By some accounts, the 17th century German chemist had more than 50. He used to collect the urine from his neighbors. Why? Well, Brandt, like a lot of great minds of his day, was in pursuit of the elusive Philosopher's Stone, the legendary substance capable of turning base metals into gold, and ambitious scientists into very rich men. Maybe it was the color, it certainly wasn't the smell, but Hennig Brandt was convinced that by distilling human urine, he could somehow create gold. He was wrong, of course, but in a vial of boiled urine, he discovered something else in 1669. It wasn't the philosopher's stone, but it was an element that would prove just as valuable and destructive, phosphorus. Welcome to Flashback, a podcast from Ozzy. I'm Sean Braswell. Today, our tale of unintended consequences centers on what would become known as the devil's element, phosphorus. The compound that Hennig Brandt unleashed would change history in some unexpected ways. It would kill tens of thousands of innocent civilians and also help feed an entire planet. And phosphorus was also the spark that lit perhaps the greatest underdog story in the history of human labor relations. Phosphorus is the most important element on the planet. This is Ken Ashley, the director of the Rivers Institute at the British Columbia Institute of Technology and a global expert on phosphorus. It's really what sustains all life on the planet. It's both inside us in our DNA and we need it to having food to live. And so it really is the, uh, the essence of, of life on Earth. But like so many good things, phosphorus has a dark side. And for a while, it was that dark side that dominated the balance of its force on the planet. Let's go back to Hennig Brandt, our urine-boiling 17th century German chemist for a moment. In his laboratory in Hamburg, Germany, Brandt tried to make magic and his own fortune. What Henning Brandt did, and you, you certainly wouldn't want to have a neighbor doing this, is that he would take gallons and gallons of, of urine that he collected from around his local neighborhood, and he boiled it, and he drove off all the moisture, and then he'd keep heating it and heating it. After months of experimenting with stagnant urine, Brandt was eventually rewarded with a newly created substance that glowed with an eerie green light. And because phosphorus glows in the dark, you can imagine from an alchemist in the, in the Middle Ages there, if you found something that glowed in the dark, you thought you were pretty close to, to the magic, uh, magic sort of compound then that uh, could transmutate uh, lead into gold. But of course, that's not what Brandt had found. White phosphorus was what Henning Brandt had, had found, and, uh, and it's not naturally found in nature because it spontaneously combusts. Brandt's dreams of gold and wealth did not pan out with white phosphorus. Yeah, Henning Brandt seems to have had a tough life. Uh, he, you know, he discovered it, and then uh, he, he, people found out that he had it, and, and they wanted to figure out how to make it too. Of course, he wanted to keep it secret because then that would mean he would get more attention and he'd be able to earn an income. And, as is so often the case, the fame and the money went not to the first inventor, but to the first salesman. A fellow German alchemist named Daniel Kraft stole Brandt's thunder and became Phosphorus's first showman. Kraft ended up doing better with it because then he claimed that he had discovered it and he was going around to various uh, courts with uh, nobility and showing it at night and sort of bringing it in in a dark room and pulling the cover off it and showing it glow in the dark. Still, no one knew quite what to do with phosphorus. 
It did not turn anything into gold, and you could only entertain the European aristocracy so long with glow-in-the-dark urine. Eventually, phosphorus was extracted from animal bones, and later from mining phosphate rocks. But it really wasn't until the 19th century that phosphorus truly came into its own. That was in 1827, when an English chemist named John Walker invented what was called the Lucifer, or what we refer to today as the match. The tiny splints of wood with white phosphorus tips soon became a transformative invention. Matches were absolutely essential. Before electricity, you didn't have hot water, you didn't have lighting, you didn't have hot food, unless you had matches. This is Louise Raw, a historian and author of Striking a Light, the Bryant and May Matchwomen and Their Place in History. Most Victorian homes were lit by candles or gaslights and heated by coal fires. And matches were a huge step forward from previous methods of starting a fire. And we see them from the 1850s onwards being sold absolutely everywhere. Everywhere that people would gather, everywhere that smokers would gather, there'd be perhaps a child, usually a little boy or a girl, with a tray or a basket of matches eagerly selling them to people. But the ones really making the money off the groundbreaking product were the match manufacturers. And the leading matchmaker in the UK was a company started by two Quaker grocers, William Bryant and Francis May. Bryant and May made and sold a variety of goods, and they quickly realized that producing matches was something that could be done very cheaply. So in 1861, they came to Bow in East London, very, very poor East London was then, and set up what they called the Fairfield Works, this match production site, and very quickly started to make a lot of money. The two men quickly went from being Quaker grocers to Victorian industrial royalty. They became incredibly rich, multimillionaires, really the equivalents of even possibly billionaires, enormous country estates, entertaining the great and good. Bryant and May's newfound wealth did not trickle down to their workforce. But in the heart of London's impoverished East End, a chemical reaction of sorts was brewing. The potent mixture of stark inequality and the hazardous effects of white phosphorus was about to result in the salvation of millions of future workers. The catalyst for this remarkable reaction? Hundreds of brave, mostly teenage girls willing to take a stand like none that the industrial world had ever seen. That's next. Do you have an interesting tale about unintended consequences from history or your own life? Please share it with us by emailing flashback at ozzy.com. That's flashback at ozy.com. History can feel like a moving target sometimes. It can be hard to pin down what happened decades ago, much less centuries. Often the stories we do pin down and tell for generations are not the whole story. And to get that story, you have to go beyond the scholars who work in the ivory towers. Louise Ra again. I call myself an accidental historian. I kind of fell into historianing by accident. I got very involved in the trade union movement. And then it was through that that I got a chance to learn what we call labour history, which is you know, the history of working people. So it's not your kings and queens necessarily, it's ordinary working people. As part of her job, Ra was given the chance to take a history course. One day, she was given an assignment. I remember thinking, oh my God, an essay. You know, I hadn't done anything like that since I was at school and I sweated blood over that first essay. Ra decided to write about the only women covered in the course, the so-called Match Girls. At best, the Match Girls strike was considered to be a colorful footnote in British labor history, a curiosity that occurred right before the strike of male dock workers in London that most scholars think was the true landmark event. In the course, you could in those days learn the history of working people and just think that women weren't involved at all, which I've subsequently found out isn't true, but it was very much told as a story of working men. Ra couldn't find a whole lot of material on the match women to write her essay, so she went digging. And the company Bryant and May, the matchmaking company, had ceased to exist in the UK in 1980, and they'd given all their records to this little local library. 
So literally down in the basement of this library were the Brighton and May records, which they kind of, you know, just kept brought to me and dumped in front of me all these huge boxes. Ross set to work. And really quickly discovered to my surprise that the story I'd been told really wasn't the way things happened. And it was actually a much more interesting and far more important story, one traditional historians had not done justice. Ra wrote her essay, and later a critically acclaimed book. Here I was, this trade unionist, not particularly well educated, did not expect to be inadvertently kind of challenging the great historians who'd written about this, but there you go, that's, that's how it turned out. The story Louise Raw uncovered in the basement of the local library was an epic Dickensian tale of perseverance and courage in the face of a corporate giant's appalling treatment of some of its most vulnerable workers. Mostly they were women and girls, and they were really famous in the area, the match girls. They were treated badly, and they were very much looked down on as well. They were as I discovered, something like a a really cool girl gang. They really looked after each other. They knew that the one thing they had was strength in numbers, so they really supported one another, which is just as well, because the employers didn't. You could tell how poorly the women were paid just by looking at them. They were extremely small and pale and frail looking, uh, even for East End working class women who were not, you know, through no fault of their own, were not the healthiest of people. Some of the workers were girls as young as nine. They were working 12-hour days from six in the morning to six at night, standing up the whole time. Most most of the work was done standing up, so it was really exhausting. And what made matters worse is that Brian and May fined them as well, which was actually illegal under the Factory Act at the time. But they fined them for the slightest infraction, really. If the girls were laughing or if they were talking or just generally mucking about a bit, as teenage girls will, then the foreman would fine them. But the workers' situation was even worse than that, something that a crusading activist and journalist named Annie Besant soon discovered. Annie Besant was a a socialist of a kind. She was for women's rights and she was becoming quite a socialist. She interviewed the women and they told her about their terrible working conditions, about the fines that they suffered and also about the biggest curse, I suppose, of matchmaking, which was Fossy Jaw. Fossy Jaw was an occupational disease of the jaw caused by exposure to phosphorus. White phosphorus is incredibly toxic, and it was being pumped in the air throughout Bryant and May's match factory. There was no escape. There wasn't even a separate dining area for workers. So they would bring in a bit of bread from home, and working class girls lived on, you know, stale bread and tea. That was that was their daily diet, no vegetables, no fruit. And by the time you got to eat it, the phosphorus particles in the air have settled onto your bread. So you've got this awful, deadly seasoning that you can't see, but it's there on your food. The first symptoms of fossy jaw were toothache and a swollen lower jaw. Then your gums, cheeks and jaw would develop putrid abscesses. But the worst thing about it, the most horrendous and really sad aspect of it is that your jawbone is decaying while you're still alive. And women would spit bits of bone the size of peas, apparently, out of these abscesses. It was a terrible situation. The match women endured these horrors for years. Enter Annie Besant. So the match women told Annie Besant all of this, and she recorded it in this really hard-hitting, brilliant article. It's only a short article, it's only a few columns, but it's called White Slavery in London, which is a really attention-grabbing title. The article appeared in June 1888. In it, Annie Besant did not just recount the women's hazardous working conditions. She emphasized the gap between them and the, quote, monstrous dividends being paid to Bryant and May's shareholders. It did not go over well with the company. Bryant and May read this article and they are furious. They've worked really hard on their PR, Bryant and May. They're very like a modern company in that respect. You know, they are no slouches in getting good publicity and presenting their good side to the public. So people think Bryant and May are quite a nice firm that are looking after their workers well. And this is really messing things up for them. The first thing the company does in response? put pressure on the match women themselves. 
they try to get them to sign a paper, which is a pre-prepared statement, saying that Annie Besant has lied, that everything she said is untrue, and that, you know, they love working for Brian and May. The old fossey jaw is no problem at all, and they're all, you know, one big happy family and treated marvellously. Remember, these women had no trade union. They had no employment contracts, and they knew that if they did the slightest thing wrong, they would be fired. But they refused to sign the paper. The foremen report that they come back to collect the papers and every single one in every single workshop on this huge factory site is blank. The women just won't sign. The first attempt to intimidate the match women hadn't worked. The next thing that they do is try to sack one girl and they make up a reason for it because they don't want to admit that they're just doing it because they think she's probably one of the people who've spoken to Annie Besant. So they visibly and forcibly removed one of the women from the factory. And also the matchmen have this tremendous solidarity. Absolutely no questions asked, they stick up for each other. So when she goes out the door, so do they. They lay down their tools and they go streaming out of this factory, out onto the Fairfield Road, out onto the Bow Road, and they start parading the neighborhood. That's right, in the summer of 1888, 1,400 workers, mostly young women and girls, walked out of Bryant and May's match factory in East London. It was a bold act of defiance. And what I love about the way they get their message across, because, you know, no Facebook, no Twitter in those days, so how do you do it? But they are very clever, and they know that although they're supposed to be powerless, one thing they do have is numbers. They can make a lot of noise, and they do. They march the streets of Bow, singing very disrespectful songs about their employers and how terrible their employers are and what they'd like to do to their employers, which is not nice. The women marched all over London, including straight through Trafalgar Square. They sang, quote, we'll hang old Brian on the sour apple tree to the theme of glory, glory, hallelujah. Observers started putting their heads out of their home and office windows to see what the fuss was about. So people throw down money. They throw down pennies and farthings and the match women catch the money that's sailing through the air in the long aprons that they wear to work. And that is their first strike funds. The young women start to get organized. They organized themselves brilliantly into a committee, had a vote on who was gonna represent them on the strike committee, went back in, put their demands to Bryant and May, who basically told them, not interested, you're all sacked, no matter what you do, we're not listening to you. Bryant and May, outraged, you know, here we are, we're rich Victorian gentlemen and these wretched, rough set of girls, as they called them, these common working people are trying to tell us what to do. They were absolutely not having it. Things did not look good for the match women at the start. When they first walk out, local papers are saying, well, I mean, how dare they? They're very lucky to be employed by these lovely top-hatted gentlemen who are so well-esteemed and friends with government and friends of the great and good and famous and lucky to have jobs. The tide really turns quickly because this is only around two weeks, this strike, and the papers start to become much more sympathetic. The press started to shame Bryant and May and accusing their shareholders of profiting off the jaws of poor women and girls. So the share price tumbles and Brian and May are forced into a climb down, incredibly reluctant, with very, very, very bad grace indeed. But the women in around two weeks go back to work triumphant and the first thing they demand is the right to form a trade union. The match women had not only improved working conditions for themselves, they had ignited a chain reaction that would do the same for millions of other workers in the years ahead. We like to think that history is all great individuals, that it's kings and queens. We're quite happy with that. Individual heroes and heroines, but you know, a, a sort of rabble of working class Irish, uneducated girls taking matters into their own hands. Oh, you know, a bit scary, sounds a bit revolutionary. So we tend to talk that down. Historians might not have taken much note of that victory, but other workers at the time certainly did. You know, working people are not stupid, and you would have to be stupid to not to notice a large, large group of workers, 1,400 women were on strike, achieving what had never been achieved. People had gone on strike, but no one had had a victory against a huge, important, powerful firm like that before. And another group of famous London laborers, the dock workers, 
would certainly have noticed. They couldn't have missed it because they were married to match women. Match women and dockers traditionally dated each other, knew each other, you know, they were each other's mothers and sisters. They all were, they were the same people, essentially, the same East End people. Three months after the match women went on strike, more than 100,000 male dock workers at the Port of London started their own strike. These women are absolutely the inspiration for this huge strike of hundreds of thousands, which spreads and spreads all over. It's practically a general strike, really, a national strike. It spreads all over the country and to other parts of the world as well. The leaders of the match women provided guidance and encouragement to their male counterparts. So they all follow the match women's example. They go out on strike and their demand for coming back to work is you must let us form a union. Hundreds and hundreds of new unions form over the next few years. By 1890, just over a year later, the number of trade union members in Great Britain had more than doubled to nearly two million. Thanks to what the match women began, Great Britain and other countries now have laws governing health and safety in the workplace. And from this, eventually grow the seeds of the Labour Party in Britain. And I was very pleased that our lamented um, former leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, acknowledged my book and my work and uh, said um, in 2016 that the match women were the mothers of the modern Labour and trade union movement. And that really was everything that I'd ever wanted. Thanks in part to Phosphorus, a revolution in labor relations and worker safety swept over England and the world in the late 19th century. But for millions of others, there would be no hiding from Phosphorus's destructive capability in the 20th century. Nearly 300 years after Hennig Brandt discovered Phosphorus, his hometown of Hamburg would suffer an almost unimaginable tragedy at its hands. We all need a break from the constant cycle, to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects, or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying The Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. It wasn't long before the qualities of phosphorus were harnessed for one of humankind's favorite pastimes, war. Ken Ashley again. Phosphorus was uh, first adopted for military use because when the white phosphorus is uh, exposed to oxygen, it, it, uh, it burns and produces a heavy white smoke, so its original use was, uh, was just to produce smoke cover. You might have seen some of the photographs of World War I trench warfare, where there is smoke covering the no man's land between the armies. And then it became used in, uh, for tracer shells. So when you fired a bullet, the phosphorus would burn. You could see where the bullets were going, particularly at night, and make it very easy to aim, aim the bullet. And then came phosphorus bombs. They were first used by the Allies in World War II. You know, after uh, Hitler started bombing, bombing England, that the uh, retribution from the, uh, from the English uh, was to do these massive raids with a thousand odd planes and they decided to pick a pick a town and try and try and just bomb it repeatedly over several nights the aim was to destroy an entire german city and to demoralize its inhabitants it was called operation gomorrah and for good reason starting on july 24 1943 and continuing for seven more nights Allied bombing raids dropped over 2,000 tons of burning phosphorus material on Hamburg, Germany's second largest city, and where Henning Brandt had discovered the volatile element. At the time, it was the heaviest assault in the history of aerial warfare. It was like a volcano going off, and the bombers said that they could see it from, from halfway from England, uh, this, uh, this huge firestorm. The asphalt streets of Hamburg literally boiled. The firestorm left more than 35,000 people dead. 
mostly women and children. Some were burned alive, some suffocated, others were sucked up into the air. The upward draft was so was so much it even it even just uh, it suffocated people even if they weren't burnt just because of the lack of oxygen because of the amount of fire going on the oxygen was combusted so it was it was a pretty brutish sort of uh, crude attempt to break the will of the people by just destroying everything. A year and a half later, the Allies firebombed another German city, Dresden. The day after the RAF strike at Dresden, B-17 bombers of the 8th United States Air Force gave the city a repeat performance. Dresden is a heap of ruins. It has been smashed to atoms. One of the unfortunate souls in Dresden during the firebombing was the American writer Kurt Vonnegut. After the bombing, as Vonnegut put it in his classic novel Slaughterhouse-Five, Dresden was like the moon. In quote, one thing was clear. Absolutely everybody in the city was supposed to be dead, regardless of what they were, and that anybody moved in it represented a flaw in the design. We've heard about the destructive capacity of phosphorus, but the element in the form of phosphates plays a hugely productive role for humanity as well. Three quarters of the planet is kept alive today because, uh, because the phosphorus that grows the food that keeps us alive has been dug out of the ground. It is thanks to phosphorus-based fertilizers that we can produce food at the scale we do today. But like so many commodities found largely in the ground, it is a scarce resource. So there's a real shortage of phosphorus and geopolitically it's I think it's going to become the flashpoint of the 21st century because so few people so few countries control uh, most of the phosphorus on the planet just five countries Morocco China the US Jordan and South Africa control 85 percent of the world's remaining phosphate rock reserves and there's no good replacement for phosphorus once we run out every person and animal on the planet depends on phosphorus and there are roughly 10 animals for every person in reality, there's around 770 billion people equivalents on the planet right now burning through phosphorus at a frightening rate. And anything keeps me up, wakes me up at night. It's uh, it's the dual threat of uh, climate change and a global phosphorus shortage that leads to mass starvation, uh, and the likes we've never seen before. Researchers are experimenting with yes, urine to help develop new fertilizers to address this phosphate shortage. But as of yet, there has not been a breakthrough to rival Hennig Brandt's over three centuries ago. So what did we learn today? First, there's a chance, a slight chance, that that crazy neighbor of yours collecting urine in his basement is actually on to something. Second, any one of us can become an accidental historian like Louise Raw. It just requires some persistence and a willingness to challenge what you've always been told. And finally, it takes an awful lot of nerve to take on a corporate giant as a lowly factory worker, but it certainly doesn't require any balls. Flashback is written and hosted by me, Sean Braswell, senior writer and executive producer at Aussie. It was produced by Robert Kulos, Tracy Moran, Yorio Diguzua, and Shannon Williamson. Chris Hoff engineered our show. Special thanks to the crew at iHeartRadio Podcast Networks, especially Sophie Lichterman and Jack O'Brien. Make sure to subscribe to Flashback on the iHeartRadio app or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Flashback is the latest podcast from Ozzy, a modern media company producing original TV series, festivals, news, and podcasts for curious people. Ozzy's unique storytelling focuses on the new and the next, whether that's forward-looking news and features, bold new perspectives on TV, or brand new ways of looking at history. Today in my lecture notes, a couple of interesting and somewhat disturbing facts which connect phosphorus to some of the topics we covered in earlier episodes of Flashback. First, did you know that while many American states were banning abortion and contraception in the late 19th century, desperate Swedish women were resorting to a very dangerous method of abortion. They would swallow the heads of phosphorus matches in the hopes of inducing a miscarriage. And second, perhaps the most insidious use of phosphorus in war has been its use in chemical weapons. In fact, by 1944, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis had developed a powerful phosphorus-based nerve gas for which there was no defense. And, as things went south in the war, Hitler's generals urged him to make use of his secret weapon. But for some reason, the Fuhrer never played that ace up his sleeve. To 
dive deeper, head to ozzy.com slash flashback. That's ozy.com slash flashback. There you can find my other lecture notes from today's episode, featuring extended interviews, links to further reading, and more information on the unintended consequences of elements like phosphorus, as well as links to other hidden stories from history, uncovered by me and other reporters at Aussie.